Well, this morning we're going to return again to Exodus chapter 15. Uh, the text is verses 22 to verse 26. And we're going to be thinking about walking by faith and not by sight. So let me take you to the introduction and uh, the introduction about walking by faith. Now, why are we talking about that? Well, it's, it seems to me that as you read through um, Exodus, especially, but you can go into the other the books of Moses, uh, Leviticus and, uh, and Numbers and so on, uh, you, you'll find there that this is a constant theme, this is a constant teaching of those books, that the children of Israel who have crossed now the Red Sea and uh, now they begin their journey in the wilderness and will eventually get to the Promised Land, uh, they were to walk by faith. And uh, we can quote 2 Corinthians 5, verse, uh, verses uh, 6 and 7, where we get the whole of the quote. Uh, so we are always, says Paul, confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are, about, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And what we discover as we look at the, the people, the, the, the children of Israel's journey, and indeed uh, throughout their history, <laughs> that they were seeking to, to walk by faith, but sadly, too often, they were, trying, they were walking by sight, and they got themselves into trouble. And we're going to see uh, that uh, this morning as we go to Exodus chapter 15 and verses 22 to verse 26. As a young Christian, and this is probably uh, true uh, for us all, you probably read those uh, wonderful Christian biographies of... Uh, uh, we, let's, let's call them saints of the past who were walking by faith and wonderful things happened, didn't they? I remember one of the stirring books that I read as a young Christian was uh, about the life of George Muller. And of uh, course, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a local Christian hero, isn't he? In the sense that, uh, you know, the, the Muller homes in, in Bristol and so on. And there were so many stories about Muller, and Muller was a ma real man who did walk by faith and not by sight, didn't he? There were so many stories about how was, they were down to their last uh, penny, they had to pay the bills, and the post arrives, and in there was a, a sum of money that covered the bill. But my greatest story uh, that I love is the story about George Muller and uh, the breakfast meal. And you probably, you all know the story, I'm sure, but I'll recount it to those people who, who don't, how, uh, um, they ha he had his orphanages, and uh, there was no money left to buy any food for breakfast, but nonetheless, the orphans were put on their tables, and uh, the, the, the bowls were out there, and, uh, uh, and they, they said, said grace, uh, gave thanks to God for the food that they were going to consume, a knock on the door, uh, but some unknown, unknown reason, the baker had baked too many loaves of bread, didn't he? And uh, he wanted to know if the if the, if the orphanages could use the bread. Well, of course they did. That was, that was Muller, walking by faith, not by sight. Um, and perhaps we have our own sort of uh, uh, stories like that. Um, but I have to say this, this is not the normal pattern of things in the Christian life. I think George Muller was exceptional, and things that happened in his life were exceptional, but that's not the normal pattern pattern of our Christian life. But nonetheless, there is a sense that if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be seeking to be walking by faith and not by uh, sight. And that involves something. And that involves something that we can see, that we will see, because this, this theme will be keep repeating itself in the book of Exodus, that it involves trusting in God. You know, that God knows best. but also in much prayer. That was something that the children of Israel had to learn. I'm not sure if I, when I've read through the whole of Exodus and I've read through all the remaining books of the books of Moses, right through to Deuteronomy, whether they really learned that lesson. But that was a lesson they were supposed to learn in their journeying in the, in the wilderness. That, and also it will be a lesson they will have to learn as they come into the promised land that they can trust God but they needs to be also surrounded by prayer, and they will have to do something. So let's go to the first point, and that is 
to look at the problem. What is the problem? Well, let's, uh, let's read what the problem is in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 22 to 24. There we read, so Moses, uh, let me look at it this way, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So we stop there. What shall we drink? Now let's, uh, let's think about the situation here. Uh, they've crossed the Red Sea. Um, they've been singing. Uh, they're having a party. Uh, God has delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians. And the very first thing that we discover is that in verse 20, uh, to Moses, uh, probably because, you know, he's a man of God, he's a prophet, uh, he knows that it's, it's t God has told, told him that it's about time that the children of Israel moved on. You can't be partying on the, the, red, the shore of the Red Sea forever. So we're told that Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They have to do this journey. They, they're, they're going to go to the Promised Land. Um, I, I'm pretty certain that Moses and the children of Israel weren't going to think it was going to take them 40 years to get there, uh, probably a few months, uh, possibly a year, but uh, not 40 years. But anyway, it's time to start the journey, journey into the, into the wilderness. And uh, the, they, they start. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. That word Shur, um, reliably informed, uh, is uh, a word that means wall. And uh, archaeologists, Egyptian uh, archaeologists and uh, Hebrew scholars uh, tell us that uh, the, the wilderness of Shur really was a place where, which was the, the, the border of Egypt. It wasn't the Red Sea, it was further on. And that the Egyptians had made a series of forts in the wilderness of Shur in order to defend themselves against any attacks from the Philistines or the Moabites or the Edomites or whatever, people would try to come and, 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 and attack them. So this was a, they'd gone through, if you like, border control. They've had their, they've had their passport stamped and now they were on their, their journey. And they, they journey into this part of the wilderness for three days, but they find no water. So we read, so they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now let's just think of this for a moment. Let's think about the numbers involved. You've got a million and a half people. I think I've said on previous occasions that estimates range between a million and two million people who left Egypt with Moses. So we're going to take an average, so let's call them a million and a half people that have been walking in the wilderness for three days, there's been no water, they've not found any water. Uh, you, you, you might think, well, if someone like Moses was just by himself, you know, uh, he was a shepherd, he knows his way around the wilderness, he could probably find a bit of water for himself. But how do you find a million and a half, uh, a million and a half water for a million and a half people? <laughs> Where's the reservoir? Well, we can dip in our water bottles and our containers and have our water. Well, they find no water. And so we can we can we can think how things must have happened, must have must have changed. They they left rejoicing. They were singing that song of Moses after three days. Well the mood's turned ugly, hasn't it? It's turned bad. And they come to the waters, they come to this waters of Mara, and the word Mara means bitterness. Uh, they think, they think, great, uh, Moses has led us, or God has led us to this water. And can you imagine the first tastes? Perhaps the people might have been running to the water. They have the first sips of water. And it's, well, it's undrinkable water. That's going to make things even worse, isn't it? It's, it's bad enough being thirsty for three days. It's even more difficult to see that, that water, that expanse of water, and you know you can't drink it. 
And so that is the situation that the children of Israel uh, are in. What can we do? How can we survive uh, in this wilderness with this undrinkable water? Uh, when we come to verse 24, we discovered that the people uh, complain and they, they grumble. Uh, verse 23, verse 24. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. And therefore the name of, of it was called Marah. They named the, the lake there, the water, Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Well, that word complained, some translations have grumbled, is a very strong word. And it has at its root the idea of, of enmity, of, uh, of, of being opposed to something. And what we're finding is that these children of Israel are uh, at odds with God. Or more especially, we might say, they're at odds with Moses. But Moses is the servant of God. So as they aim their complaints, their grumbles, their moans, their enmity against Moses, what they're doing is that they're aiming their enmity against God. Why has God led us to this place? And we're going to hear this sort of refrain from the children of Egypt, uh, children of Israel, again and again as you go through these chapters. You'll see it again in the next chapter, in chapter 16, when it comes to the fact they haven't got any food. And so you can, you can see the way that they are complaining, they're grumbling, they, uh, why has God done this? And to be fair, you can't blame them, can you? They've gone three days with no water. I mean, think of sometimes of the children of Israel, and I like the emphasis sometimes of children, because <laughs> they are like children, aren't they? Are we nearly there yet? Why can't we have this? Why can't we have that? Well, they are a bit like that. But you can't blame them. Three days, all the water's gone, they can't find any water. They they, they have this water, but they can't drink it. Well, what the, what's happening is this, they're walking by sight, aren't they? They're looking for something tangible. They're forgetting about God. It seems an impossible situation. How can you give fresh, clear drinking water to a million and a half people in the middle of a wilderness, and all you've got is this undrinkable water? I think we need to say to ourselves that we can be as guilty as they, can't we? You know, we can't, we can't say, oh, well, you know, if we were them, we wouldn't have done it that way. You know, we would have been super saints, we would have prayed to God, and uh, no, we would have been just like them. Why has God led us this place, to this place? Now, perhaps in your own Christian experience, you've been in such a situation yourself. Something's happened in your life, something's happened perhaps in your family or, or, or something, and sin, because sin is still in us, isn't it? We're still sinners, but we're sinners, if we are a Christian, a sinner saved by grace. You know that there will be that anger that will bubble up, and you can get angry with God. Lord, why have you, why have you done such a thing to me or to my family? Why have you allowed this to happen? Lord, don't you love me? Don't you care for me that this thing is taking place? Now, perhaps we've all been in a situation like that, you know, where we've been sort of angry, angry uh, against God. Well, of course, obviously, that's the wrong attitude to take with God. God is a God of love. God is a God, a God of mercy. God is a God of grace. And I think we need to realize that as they are grumbling and complaining, and I think I mentioned it already, really, we need to be aware that behind it all is not a complaint against Moses. Moses is just the spokesperson. He's just the physical representation, if you like, of the messenger of God. They're angry with God, aren't they? So what happens? Well, that's the second point. Moses prays. It's the prayer of Moses. And we read that in Exodus 15 and verse 25. So he cried out to the Lord, that's Moses, and the Lord showed him a tree when he cast it into the waters 
uh, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance to them, and there he tested them. Well, so just think of yourself in Moses' position. One and a half million people. That's a lot of people. There's Moses. There's this angry mood of the people. There's you. <coughs> this is going to get nasty. It's me, and there's the rest of the children of Israel. What can you do? What can Moses do? <laughs> There's only one thing he can do. And that's pray, isn't it? And he does pray. He prays to God. But can you imagine the type of prayer that Moses uh, would pray? And we're not told how he prayed. We know he had the answer. And we'll look at that in a moment. But how does Moses pray? Well, let me give you a, a suggestion, for, I think, from the scriptures of how a person prays when they're in an almost, well, an impossible situation. He may well have prayed about the God, about the promises of God. He may have said something like this. Lord, you know, way back in Exodus chapter 3, you promised that when I took the people of, his, uh, people of the children of Israel out of Egypt, we would go to Mount Sinai, and then I would go up to the mountain, and I'd see you face to face. And, you know, you can imagine the prayer. Lord, you have promised and we can do that with God, can't we? Because God has given us so many promises in the scriptures that we can pray a prayer that says, and, and, and say to God, well, Lord, you promised. You're our Father in heaven. And you promised to do this or to do that. So that's probably what he was, began to pray. Lord, you've promised. He may well have prayed to God about what God has already done. Lord, uh, look what, you, what you've done. You've divided the Red Sea. You're going to allow the people of Israel to die in the wilderness after you've done that? Lord, you, you, uh, you gave all those plagues uh, to, uh, in Egypt and you spared your people. Are you going to destroy your people now that they're in the wilderness? Well, you can pray like that, can't you? But I'm sure he also must certainly have prayed a prayer that, that said something like this. Lord, I don't know what to do next. I haven't a clue but I trust you in it. Or you might have said something like this, Lord, I've been in the same situation with you before, and you got us out of this uh, situation. I can trust you in this situation too. You see, what happens, so you look at that in verse 25, is that I think that there we read, uh, there he made, uh, uh, God made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. God tested the children of Israel, and they failed the test, didn't they? Because they were complaining and they were grumbling. They were not walking by, by faith. They wanted to walk by sight. They wanted to see what God was going to do. They wanted God to do something before they, they needed him to do something. But Moses, well, he's walking by faith. And he passes the test, doesn't he? But... What, what do they have to do? Well, if we go a little bit further on, um, well, in verse 25, so he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Now, a lot of modern translations have translated this as a log, but it is actually in Hebrew a tree. And I think it's not just a log, because I have this picture of my mind, Moses picking up a log and just chucking it in the water. I don't think God was going to do, going to do it like that. I don't know if you've ever been in the, in the woodland somewhere and you've got this tree that has fallen down and it's a huge tree and it's a, how are you going to move a tree like that? Well, I think they, they were there. Uh, they, Mo, Moses is pointed, uh, God points out to Moses this tree. It's a and I've got, a, in my imagination, a big tree. You've got a million and a half people. You can move a tree with a million and a half people, can't you? So I'm, I suggest to Moses, he said, look, God's told me to pick up this tree and to throw it into the water. And so I need some volunteers. I'm not sure how big the tree was. We don't know. But let's say we've got, a, we've got 50 people, 50 strong men who come along, pick up this tree, and they, they throw it into the water and to this water of Mirabah. And the waters become 
fresh and drinkable. So what's this all about? Why a tree? Uh, why couldn't Moses just get his, his staff? Uh, he used it for dividing the Red Sea, didn't he? Why can't he just wave his staff around the water and it all can become fresh? Well, one, one reason is you don't want to make the staff an idol, do you? You don't want to say, you don't want the children of Israel to think the power of God is only in that staff. No, but also there's a demonstration that this is only of God, not of Moses. Because Moses is going to say, God told me to do this. God told me to take up this tree, throw it into the water, and the water's become fresh. It's a very visual demonstration of God's power. Because think about this. As the people are getting their now, now uh, fresh, clean drinking water, there in the middle of this lake, is a great big tree floating there. Why is it there? God told Moses to put it there, in there. And if they put the tree into the water, the water will be uh, made fresh. But also I think it's a reminder uh, to, the Egypt, uh, to the children of Israel about Egypt and what happened in Egypt. It's a, if you like, it's an echo of a memory that they had. Because what was the first plague that God afflicted the Egyptians with. This is a, a Sunday school uh, one, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to test anybody out. The first plague was the, the river Nile turning red, and the waters of the Nile became undrinkable. That was the first plague, wasn't it? Well, Israel, the children of Israel, have come to a similar situation in a way, but in kind of reverse. The waters of the lake of Mirabah were, Amara rather, were uh, undrinkable. But God did the reverse. He made it drinkable. That's God's grace, isn't it? Their rebellion didn't deserve such a blessing from God. Their rebellion, really, even at this moment, would deserve the plagues of God coming upon them. But God is gracious to them. He spares them. They're able to have that drinking water. So let's uh, look at the answer to prayer. And we, we go into verse 25 and verse 26 here. So he cries to the Lord, Moses, the Lord shows him a tree. They lift the tree, they throw it into the, into the waters. The waters were made sweet. Then he made a statute, as God made the statute and ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the word, the, the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of uh, the diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So there's a reference back again to the, to the Egyptians and to the plagues, isn't it? There in verse 26. And, and there's a condition. There's a condition to this prayer of Moses. As God answers prayer, what they have to do, what they have to be is diligent. They have to be true to God's commandments. They have to be trusting in God. It's not... It's not simply just walking by sight, it's walking by faith and not by sight. It's trusting God to lead them through this wilderness and to lead them into the promised land and to be their God and that God will do the best for them. But if they don't trust, if they're not obedient to God, then they can expect the plagues of Egypt to fall upon them. In other words, what God is saying is something like this. Do you think that situation you've just, you've just gone through is tough? That you had gone three days without, without any water, but I made the water sweet, and the waters of, Mar uh, of Mara, and now, if you don't walk by faith, if you don't trust me in these things, if you don't keep my commandments, well, what God is saying really is things could go, get a whole lot worse. Because remember the plagues that came upon the Egyptians. Well, do the, do the, uh, the children of Israel heed God's word? 
Well, yes, they do. For a season. Because if you go down to verse 27, you see what happened next. Then they came to Elim. They obviously didn't stay long at the waters there. But they come to this place called Elim, where they were, there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. And so they camped there by the waters. Well, they've gone in. The, 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 it's like a holiday destination. I got this picture in my mind of all these palm trees and this wonderful waters and, you know, um, ice cream parlor. No, it wouldn't be an ice cream parlor, but you know what I mean. It's the kind of place you'd want to go on a holiday. And so God has said, right, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break now. Uh, here's a holiday destination. It's Elim. You can stay there for a bit. When you get to the next chapter, chapter 16, which we'll see on another occasion, well, it looks like they got short-term memory loss because they've forgotten what happened at the waters, the bitter waters, and now they start moaning and complaining and going through exactly the same cycle that they did, but this time about food. And again, I suppose we could say, well, we can't really blame them, uh, but there's a question that we need to ask ourselves, and it is this, are we trusting God? Are we ourselves walking by sight? I believe in God if everything works out okay. If I can, I can see that everything is working out okay. But when things go wrong, I'm not sure I'm going to trust God. Well, that's not the Christian walk, is it? The Christian walk is when things start to seem to go wrong and unravel, we need to trust God in it. And we need to be walking by faith and not by sight. So let me ask you a question of us. How good are your memories? Because it seems to me the children of Israel didn't have very good memories. They should have had. But how good are our memories? Especially when bad things happen to us. Are we, are we remembering other times when God, when God has led us through difficult paths and testing times and God has got us through that? And we can look back and say, yeah, God was in that. And, uh, and that we trusted God in that. Can we recall God's grace to us in past days? Times when we thought we didn't deserve such things from God's hand. But he did bless us. And he did help us. Are we trusting and obeying God in our lives every day? Day to day? And even as bad things come towards us, come at us, and bad things do, it's true of every Christian, Christian's experience that we have our good times, but there are those times that are bad, difficult times, trying times, testing times. Can we really say, do we really believe this, that God knows best? That even in the bad times, we can say, God is allowing this to happen and there's a purpose behind it and God who is good and God who is our Father knows that, is, that it is the best thing for us at that time because it will strengthen faith. It will help us to be more like Jesus. Can we trust God in those bad times and just be able to say truly and honestly that God knows best? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the fact that you are the almighty God. You are the God who is all-powerful. We thank you, Father, that in a situation that Moses and the children of Israel were in at the, at the waters, that those bitter waters, that, Lord, you know what was best for them. As they grumbled and they complained, Lord, you gave a, a mighty miracle that showed how you cared for them, how you loved them, that how you could turn bad things around for good. We thank you, Lord, that you brought them to that, that nice place, Elim, as well. Lord, we know that in, in our Christian lives there is those ups and those downs and there are times when we're on the mountaintops and everything is wonderful and we can praise you with a glad heart and then there are times when we're down on the, the valley floor and things are dark. But in the dark times, 
especially in those dark times. Lord, help us to have that, that walking by faith. Help us to have that confidence in you, that trust in you, to know that even when things are so bad, that you love us and you will do the very best for us in whatever situation we find ourselves. And Lord, we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.